let me just jump right in. So what am I going to tell you about today? Um, we're going to talk about optimization. I'm going to, here's an outline. I'm going to tell you what is optimization and why you should use optimization. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our pricing problems at Anheuser-Busch, so the high-level pricing problem we have when dealing with beer pricing, and what are the components of that problem, and a little bit about how to solve that optimally or using optimization. So what's the formulation of the optimization part of the problem, and how do we solve that problem? The first, a little bit about me. Who am I? Hi, I'm Eric Hart. Um, I work for Anheuser-Busch, uh, or in Canada, the subsidiary Labatt. Uh, we sell beer. Um, why are we, who are a CPG company selling beer, doing machine learning? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. There's, I mean, we're at an NL conference. You guys can probably guess there's lots of natural problems we have, like optimal pricing, like price, or optimal routing, but also things like demand estimation or volume forecasting are really important to us. And a few years ago, we looked around and we said, hey, you know, we're spending a lot of money on vendors who are sort of building products for us. Sometimes those products are like software products. Sometimes they're models. But we're spending a lot of money on, on vendors. And every two or three years, we have to sort of start again. Because even if we're still employing those same vendors, the people who built those models or those products for us have left. And it's hard to sort of like level them up. And so we started taking a build, don't buy mentality. And now we're doing this sort of thing ourselves. And so that's why sort of we're getting into this space, and that's why there's somebody like me from Labatt who can talk to you about something like optimal pricing. Um, and a quick question. People often ask me, am I to blame for high beer prices? Um, no. I, I would prefer you to think that I am to thank when there's a discount on beer. Um, OK. So um, what is this presentation? I, I sort of gave you the outline already, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about what optimization is. I'm going to tell you a little bit about price optimization at Anheuser-Busch. And we're going to focus on the optimization part. There's actually really, really interesting modeling work involved in price optimization as well, uh, when you have to start understanding elasticities. But we're going to maybe glance at it for a minute, but we're not going to focus on that. We're here to talk about optimization. And I'm going to try to convince you that optimization is a great focus area for a lot of businesses. OK, so back to the outline. We're getting into the first part. What is optimization? Uh, so while we could look it up, optimize is a verb. Makes, means making something as good as it can be. Um, the word origin comes from Latin optimus. There's optimus prime. Um, also, if you look up mathematical optimization on Wikipedia, you'll get some great definition like it's the selection of a best element uh, with regard to some criteria from a set of available alternatives. Maybe those things are starting to hint at the problem, but they're not really telling you what optimization is in a business context. So like business-centric optimization, what's that? That's about making business decisions. It's not about predicting things. It's not about modeling. It's not even about uncovering truths or relationships. It, it, um, it's about sort of making the right business decision. And so for example, in optimal pricing, the optimization part is about choosing the prices. It's not about understanding sort of when I raise this price, what's that going to do to my revenue or my demand? That's important, and we need to know that, but that's not what the optimization is about. The optimization is about, OK, once I, under, once I believe I know that relationship, how do I choose the prices? So for that reason, I love the term optimization layer. It's sort of a layer that sits on top of the model. So you'll hear me use this a lot if we speak about optimization layer. Uh, optimization later, I'll probably talk about an optimization layer sitting on top of your model. So I just want to sort of get this phrasing out there so people can start using it. I want you to use the term optimization layer, not an optimization model. Modeling is something else. This sits on top of modeling. It is part of data science, though. It's a key part of data science, and it is a key part that's often overlooked by businesses. So why should you use optimization? So here's some examples from Anheuser-Busch. Um, so one example is price optimization. So that's what we're talking about today. You're going to have to balance the additional revenue you might get from raising the price with maybe losing some demand. You raise prices, maybe less people buy your product, but you make more money from all the people who do buy your product. Maybe it's a good decision. Optimal routing is another great example. We've got a whole bunch of breweries who are making beer, and we have to get that beer to wholesalers. And so how do we make sure that we're getting it to the right places at the right time? That's an optimization problem. Optimal assortment is another optimization problem. You've got a store. You say, hey, there's only so much room for different products in that store. What is the best sele selection of products I can put in that store to make the most money? If I change the selection, I might sort of have more available options, but that might overwhelm people. It might mean that I run out of the options I have quicker. So there's trade-offs there. So making the right decision in terms of assortment is an optimization problem. Even marketing is an optimization problem. It costs money to do marketing. How do you trade off the cost of marketing with the value of finding new customers? So um, what makes optimization hard? This is from one of my favorite web comics, XKCD. I'll just pause for a minute and let you read it. It 
see a few people start to giggle, so maybe, maybe a bunch of you are done. But yeah, this is a hard problem. If I said to you, here's a list of appetizers, uh, give me the set of appetizers that costs $15.05, it's not easy to do that. Maybe you can uh, go back to these slides later and try to figure it out. There's actually two answers to this problem. Uh, the creator of this comic intended there to only be one. It's such a hard problem that he actually screwed up, and there's two different answers in here. Um, so, so when should you use optimization? Well, you might consider using optimization versus having a human make decisions. Um, like, for example, in the case of optimal pricing, should I use optimization to price my products, or should I have a human just decide what the prices are? And there's a couple of different considerations you should pay attention to. One, if there's competing objectives, then it's going to get harder and harder for a human to make those decisions. So I sort of hinted at this before, and we're going to dig into it later. There's like a trade-off between um, revenue and market share in the case of pricing, and, and that's an example of why that trade-off makes it harder and harder for humans to make decisions. And it, the other reason why you might want to use sort of software or, or mathematical tools is because of the scale of the problem. When the scale gets really big, it gets really hard to have humans make this problem. And so, again, we're going to see an example of this in a minute, a, a very concrete example. Um, so, so let's get into that. So I love doing this in presentations, just giving a toy problem as easy as I can. So this is the easiest optimal pricing problem I can think of. Um, so imagine you have a store. It sells Budweiser. It's selling six, pack, six packs of Budweiser for $10. Okay, right now it's selling 10, 000, um, sorry, 100,000 packs of Budweiser a month. And we've done some research, and we know that every time we increase the price by 1%, we lose three quarters of a percent of sales or demand. So what price should I use to, to maximize revenue? I want to make the most money. What price should I set? Now, I would love to put a problem here that's so easy that you guys just all knew the answer uh, looking at it. Unfortunately, in this case, even the simplest problem I could think of is maybe slightly too hard for you to do this in your head. So I'm going to throw some math on the screen. So warning, um, I'm going to throw up some equations. They're not even that hard, but uh, if you don't like equations, don't worry. It's only one slide. Um, so, so we can solve that problem using calculus. It's pretty easy. So you start with your um, base price, your base demand. I'm going to call that quantity epsilon. That's what we're going to call the price elasticity later. That's when you raise price by 1%, how much demand do you lose? 0.75%. I'm going to call that epsilon. Uh, and then we've got this sort of relationship that says the percentage change in quantity equals epsilon times the percentage change in price. And what I want to do is I want to maximize revenue, which is price times quantity. OK, so you just multiply price times quantity. You use your equation on the third line there to sub in for Q. You have a single equation for revenue in terms of only one variable P. You take a derivative. You set that equal to 0, and you solve for P. Uh, and in this case, your optimal price is $11.66. So it turns out that you should have raised your price a little bit. You were selling your beer for $10 a case. You can actually raise the price to $11.66. You'll make a little bit more money. You'll lose a little bit of demand. But it'll be a good trade-off. Easy? Everybody with me? Cool. Let's make it a little bit harder. I'm going to add a constraint. Okay? And the constraint is going to be that you want to maintain a sales volume of at least 9,000 packs. Okay? You were starting by, uh, sorry, uh, I should have said 90,000 packs there. You were starting with 100,000 packs. Um, sorry, no, I got it right. It was 10,000 packs, and I want to go down to 9,000. Sorry. 10,000 packs, and you want to keep 9,000 um, after you make your change. So, there's a constraint now. This makes things a little bit harder. Actually, if you've already solved the original problem, which I call the unconstrained problem, in this particular case, it's even easier to solve this one. Um, I haven't told you this yet, but you could go back and check this of the original problem. Uh, if you set the price to the unconstrained optimum of $11.66, you're only going to sell 8,750 cases. Not quite enough. Maybe you've got contracts. Maybe you have to buy at least 9,000 cases a month, and so you need to sell at least that many cases. Okay. So in this case, you could set the price to $11.33. I won't do the math to show you, but you could probably do this one on paper, too. Um, and you'll sell exactly 9,000 cases, and, uh, and you'll, it'll be $11.33 is the price that you want to set. Cool. OK, let's step it up one more time. So this time, your store is going to sell Budweiser, Bud Light, Stella Artois, Michelob Ultra, Ho Garden, Shock Top, Mill Street, Organic, Mill Street, Tank House, and some other things. And you're going to sell six packs, 12 packs, maybe some singles. OK, are you guys ready for all of the data I'm going to show? Just kidding. I'm not going to throw all those numbers on the board. Um, but you can imagine that you're going to need a lot of data to even start thinking about that problem, right? You're going to need all of the initial prices. You're going to need all of the initial volumes. You're going to need all of the self-elasticity. That's how those demands change when you change price of that item. And there's something else that you haven't seen yet, which is the cross-elasticity. Whenever I change the price of one item, the demand for that product might change. But the demand for the other products might change, too. 
When I say, hey, I'm going to raise the price of Budweiser, the demand for Stella Artois might increase because less people want Budweiser at a higher price, they're more willing to jump to something else, maybe they're gonna buy Stella instead. So there's a trade-off here. And, and when you have this kind of problem, there's lots of different products, it's really hard for a human to make these decisions optimally, and that's where you really wanna get software involved. Uh, so hopefully you can imagine why it's important to have data science involved in solving this problem. Unfortunately, many organizations actually don't have data science solving this problem, even organizations that have a data science team. What I've seen in practice in a lot of places is that the data science team is really focused on building that model. It's finding out what that price elasticity is. It's looking at the data and saying, historically, here's the prices, here's the volumes we sold. We put those together, we can build a model that says, okay, I understand how prices and volumes are related. And then they stop there and they say, okay, I have this model and I'm turning that over to the business team. And, and the business team asks for this. They're not clamoring for the data scientists to get involved and tell them how to set prices. They think they know best because they've been doing it for years. And by the way, they're really good at it. That's why they've been doing it for years. They're great at it. They're just not as optimal as they could be if they were using math and data science. Okay, so let's talk about Anheuser-Busch's problem. So what's our problem? Well, we sell a lot of beer, a lot of different kinds of beer, more than the ones I listed on the previous slide. There's a lot. We sell them in a lot of different pack sizes. There's singles and six packs and 12 packs and 24 packs and 36 packs and eight packs and there's different bottle sizes as well um, and cans and there's draft, we sell in kegs. And there's lots of different relationships between all of these prices, right? So um, in different states and provinces, there might be relationships between how we can price the beer and these things are gonna sort of be relevant to our pricing problem. Maybe we have rules that say, hey, we don't want to price the beer differently in Ontario and Quebec. Um, what about different cities and regions? Okay, so, so we can price it differently in Ontario and Quebec, but are two different cities in Ontario? Do we have to price the beer the same way there if they're close together? Is there some relationship that we need to maintain? What about in different stores in the same city? If I take two stores in Toronto, two different kinds of stores, one's an LCBO and one's your grocery store, is there a restriction on how I can change prices between those stores? What about via different channels? So in this case, I probably mean a channel like the LCBO versus a channel like the bar. You don't have to buy a pint at the bar. You go to a bar or a restaurant and buy a can of beer. Should that beer have a relationship in price to the can of beer that you bought at the LCBO or the beer store? What about different pack sizes? I mean, obviously, this is, you, you know some of these answers here, but these are things you need to think about, right? You don't want to sell beer in a 12-pack where the price per bottle is more than it was if you just bought a single bottle because then nobody's going to buy that 12-pack. It doesn't make any sense. They're just going to buy 12 single bottles for less money. Also, you have to think about things like styles and segments. So, so when I say styles, I usually mean something like a lager or an IPA or a stout or a porter. Um, and so we, in our pricing problem, we actually don't care so much. So we don't say anything about the price of lagers needs to be somehow consistent between different lagers, uh, although we could. Um, but we do care about segments. So when I say segments, I mean there's some beer that we label as like core products. So we market these as like core beer and there's other things that maybe we market as super premium beer. So maybe the difference between like Bud Light and Corona or Stella or something, okay? And so we do care and say, you know, in general, prices in the core beer product, uh, core beer segment should be less than things in the um, super premium segment, for example. And there's lots of different segments. And so we need to pay attention to all of these things when we're pricing beer. And so to solve this problem at all the different levels of granularity, at different geographies, at different pack sizes, different products, we're gonna actually break this up into multiple different optimization problems. We're gonna start at a high granularity, just making high granularity decisions. We call that strategy, okay? And we're gonna start at the level of state or province, and we're gonna cross it with segment. So like, in Ontario, super premium beer, I'm gonna set the average price for super premium beer in Ontario. I'm not gonna worry about pack sizes or anything else. I'm just gonna say, okay, super premium beer in Ontario, the average price per hectoliter should be such and such, and I'll give you a price. And then later, we're gonna go down, and we're gonna say, okay, now that I know what that price per hectoliter on average is for super premium beer in Ontario. I'm gonna break that up into for the different kinds of beer that are in a super premium category, in different packages and different channels, all the things I talked about before. And so if I tell you that that's how we solve our problem, you might have a fair question. Is this truly optimal? Could I have optimized things better if I had looked at the whole problem in one shot instead of breaking it up into two different segments? And that's a fair question, and it may not be optimal. You might have, if you were capable of doing so, been able to find a better solution, better according to one of our sort of objectives, 
or all of our objectives, if you looked at this whole thing in one shot and you had an optimization model that could solve everything together. But that problem actually becomes almost intractable. So one advantage of breaking it up this way where we sort of solve a high level strategy problem and then we try to solve the more individual problems is it makes the problem a lot more tractable. There's another advantage, which is that it decentralizes control, which is a good thing, while allowing us to have coherent business strategy. So we can have people making coherent business strategy that says something like, hey, in Ontario, for super premium, we want to uh, increase prices by 5%, or we want to sort of do something like this. And, and we, we make a decision sort of for an, optimal, for an optimal decision for whatever reason we have, and then we cascade that down to the region, and then people in Ontario say, okay, I know what my average should be for super premium in Ontario, but I also know things in Ontario that might be different than in Quebec or in New Brunswick, and so I'll make decisions at a lower level differently uh, in order to meet this constraint that was the optimal um, constraint put by the high-level strategy problem. So this is a good thing for us. Okay, so what are some of the components of the pricing problem for us? What's the, so let's, let's ask this question. What's the input for making our pricing decisions? That's actually the wrong first question to ask. Don't ask that yet. Uh, first, we want to ask, what's the goal for the pricing decisions we want to make? What's our objective? Do we want to maximize revenue, or do we want to maximize profit? Uh, those are almost the same thing, actually. Uh, but, but do we care about those things? They're, they're kind of subtle, but that seems like a pretty obvious choice, right? I just want to make money. But what if we could make more money but sell less beer by pricing the beer higher? We talked about this already, right? I raise the price of beer. Maybe less people buy beer, but I make more money per beer. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, is that a good decision? Well, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe I want to maximize rep market share instead of profit. That's a totally different objective. At this point, you can start to imagine having a conversation with yourself. Wait, who cares about market share? We just want to make money, right? But wait, market share is more stable over time than revenue. So if we want to keep making money, maybe we do care about market share. But we don't want to be Amazon and ignore profits for the next decade. We have shareholders, you know. We want to be making money. Wait a minute. Did we just realize that profits over different time horizons are actually competing objectives? Ooh, this is getting hard. How do we solve this problem? Actually, this problem we don't ask optimization how to solve. This is what our board of directors is for. <laughs> it's a hard problem, and so we push it off to the board of directors, and they can make the decision about how much we want to trade off market share for profit this year. This year, we want to make more profits, and we're willing to sacrifice some market share for that profit. Now, they might have questions about how much market share do we really need to sacrifice in order to make a certain amount of profit, and they might want to ask us that question. They might want to go to their models and say, hey, uh, and, and, their, and their optimization layer, and say, hey, if we're doing things optimally, how can we sort of balance these objectives? And then once we tell them, here's how you can balance the objectives, they may say, okay, here's the, the tack we want to take this year. So optimization can help you figure out how to do this, and it can even help sort of, if you're using it strategically, help set your set of options. But it's not going to tell you what your objective is. You need to figure that out for yourself. So we're going to need to know our objective, and that's not a trivial piece of the puzzle. Um, but back to our other question, what's the input for making our pricing decisions? And the answer to that is price elasticity. And so a quick primer on elasticity. I'm not going to go too far into this. Like I said, this is sort of on the modeling side, but there's really interesting questions here too. So, so typically, um, a self price elasticity is framed as, for a given product, if you increase the price by 1%, um, what is the uh, percentage change in demand going to be? And we'll call that epsilon. That's going to be a price elasticity. Typically, for a given product, you would expect that to be negative. When you increase the price, you lose some demand. And cross price elasticity is when I increase the price by 1% for one product, how much do I lose um, demand in a different product? Or actually, how much do you gain demand in a different product? Epsilon, in the case of a cross elasticity, you usually expect it to be positive. Because usually, if I raise the price of one product, less people buy the product that I raise the price of, and more of them jump to competing products. Now, a quick point about elasticity that is going to come up again um, is that it would be really great if we could have elasticity functions, where we could say, OK, at any point in the price-demand space, we know how changing the price will change the, the demand. But typically, it's really, really hard to get a full function of price elasticity. We're going to be stuck with point elasticities. We're going to say, OK, at the current price-demand point, we, we can guess what's going to happen if we raise price by 1%. If we raise it by 1% and then later we raise it by another percent, uh, if we raise it by 1% and then we let things settle, and then later we raise it by another percent, that elasticity may be different after we raised it once and let things settle. So, so typically it's going to be really hard to have enough data to actually model that. And that's important. We're going to come back to it. 
Okay, so let's talk about optimal beer pricing. So how do you formulate an optimization problem? So there's three key components you need if you want to formulate this thing in math. The first one is your decision variables. That's the thing that you get to decide. So if you're doing some sort of optimization, you're going to get to decide something. Uh, those are called your decision variables. In the case of optimal beer pricing, it's the prices. It's, we're going to choose the prices in order to optimize something, whether it be market share or revenue or, or whatever we want to optimize. But even, even this simple thing, there's, there's tricks that you have to be aware of. So in the case of optimal beer pricing, there's different prices that we could talk about. So when we sell beer, we don't sell beer directly to consumers. You can't come to Labatt and buy beer. You're going to go to the LCBO and buy beer. We're going to sell beer to the LCBO, for example. So what price do we want to talk about? There's a trade-off. We could talk about our price to the wholesaler, for example, or the wholesaler to the retailer. There's, in the US, for example, there's a three-tiered system. It's, it's, legal, it's illegal to do anything else. So we must sell beer to wholesalers who sell it, to retailers who sell it, to customers. And um, so there's a few different prices. But if we talk about our price to um, wholesalers, that's the price that we have most control over. So it would be nice to build our models in terms of that. Because once we say, OK, we know how our price to wholesaler affects demand, then we can just set the prices however we want. But the relationship between that price and demand is not so stable, right? The, the, the actual relationship in terms of demand by consumers is the price that consumers see. It's the price from the um, retailer to the consumer. And so if we look at that price, that tends to make a much more stable relationship in terms of price elasticities. But at the end of the day, then we're like, OK, we know what price to set, but we can't directly set it. We don't actually set the price for retailers. We just set the price to wholesalers and hope it cascades. So there's some tricky questions here, even when you're starting out, saying, OK, what are our decision variables? And then once you've made that choice, you have to decide what your objective function is. And this is sort of the thing I've already been talking about. Do you want to re uh, optimize revenue or market share or profit or, or what? Um, so there's lots of choices to make here as well. And even those choices are not as simple as you think. Once you decide what you want to optimize, like, hey, I want to optimize revenue, um, or profit is a good example, you need to formulate that in terms of the decision variables that you just picked. So if you pick the price to consumer, you need to find a way to write down a formula that says, hey, here's my revenue or my profit in terms of the price to consumer. And that's related to the price to the wholesaler. Everything's related in a big chain. And if you actually do this, you're going to talk to your revenue management team, and they're going to say, well, this is all great, but you know, the thing I actually want to optimize is not my profit, it's my EBITDA. Um, and if you're used to talking to business people and you're you know what the word EBITDA means, great. And if not, like me when I started this thing, you're like, OK, well, now I need to figure out what EBITDA means and also how to write down a formula for EBITDA in terms of the prices from the retailers to the customers. This starts to get tricky. But this whole thing can be done. And then there's a third component of the optimization problem, with, which is a constraint. And that's actually the most interesting one of all. And so um, a good example is market share. So if you chose to optimize revenue or profit, then you probably want a constraint on market share. So, so that's how you're going to be able to trade off the, the competing objectives, by putting constraints on some of the objectives that you're not specifically optimizing for. There's also lots of room for creativity here. So you can use constraints to balance competing objectives. You can also use constraints to stay within a region where the underlying model makes sense. So when I said I'd come back to the information about the point elasticities, this is what I was talking about. So what will often happen is you have some elasticities that say, OK, when I change the, um, the price by a certain amount, if I change the price by 1%, the demand is going to, um, if I increase the price by 1%, demand is going to decrease by 0.75. Uh, if I increase the price by 10%, is the demand going to fall by 7.5%? Maybe more. These things might not be linear. That's why I said it would be great if we had the whole uh, uh, elasticity function, but we don't. We have a point elasticity, and so we probably want to stay in some sort of neighborhood around the point where we actually have a good elasticity estimate. And so one way to make sure that you're doing that in the optimization is to use constraints and say, OK, don't go too far away from where I used to be. Um, and you know, if, if we want to keep raising prices over time, then we'll raise them a little bit, and then we'll get some new data, and we'll rebuild our elasticity estimates, and then we'll, get, then we'll, we'll raise them again. We shouldn't sort of make these huge price jumps, because we, we really don't know what's going to happen in those cases. And another thing that constraints are great for is balancing the input from different stakeholders. So one thing that happens to us is we work a lot with what we call the revenue management team. So, so these are people responsible for things like setting prices. There's another whole team that's responsible for logistics. They're deciding how much beer to produce. They have their own models that are like, hey, this is how much beer we think we're going to sell, and so we need to buy things like you know, grain uh, to, figure out, or to make beer, and then we're going to figure out how much grain we need to buy at the beginning of the year to make enough beer to sell this year. And if we work with the revenue management team, we're like, hey, did you know that if you set prices in such and such a way, you can sell way more beer than you were expecting? This is wonderful. 
And then we go talk to that logistics team and they just laugh at you and they're like, listen, I know the revenue management team loves to hear it when you say you're gonna make lots of money, but um, turns out that we have models too and we're pretty confident that you're, there's no way in heck that you're ever going to sell more than a certain amount of beer. Okay, we can use that as a constraint too. We can go back to our model and say, hey, model, you're constrained to never believe that you're going to sell more than X amount of beer. That's a constraint coming from another team that we can be respectful of. And that's important later because building trust between teams is really important when you're doing this kind of work. Okay, so once you have your problem set up, you've got your three components, how do you solve it? So what's involved in solving the problem? Um, so tooling, uh, tooling is a big thing. I mean, you could try to solve this thing by hand or write your own code, but probably you shouldn't do that. There's lots of great tools out there, even open source ones. So we use the framework Pyomo and the solver IPopt, which are both open source, and I can recommend them. Um, they're wonderful. Uh, if you want to solve this problem, you really need to understand the regime that you're in. So um, I've got some acronyms here, but like linear programming is different than non-linear programming, is different than mixed integer linear programming, et cetera. So in the beer pricing world, we're in the regime of non-linear programming. Um, and so that's why we're using IPopt, uh, which is part of the open source CoinOR package, and I, I'm not affiliated with them, I'm just trying to tell you what we use. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's great for non-linear programming, but if you're doing something else, then you're gonna have to use a different solver. So understanding what tooling you're gonna use is really important. Another thing you're gonna need to do is lots of iterating, okay? Uh, there's gonna need to be lots of business feedback loops where you go back to the business and say, hey, here's like my first pass at the output. What do you think of this? Um, and they're gonna say, this is crazy. You, the optimizer did something wrong. It set this, the price of this beer to be way lower than we would ever set it. Sure, it looks like we're gonna make a lot of money, but we know something that you don't and, and we've got business constraints. So you can't do that. Okay, we'll put another constraint in there and you go back and you run it again. And then, then you go back to them and you say, hey, here's, here's our output now. And you just iterate again and again. You have to have patience. You're gonna do a lot of iterating with your, your business stakeholders. Uh, you're gonna find mistakes, you're gonna fix them, and you're gonna add a lot more reasonability constraints. That's the thing I was just sort of alluding to, uh, similar to what I was saying with when you're using constraints to keep yourself in the range of where your model makes sense. It's like, okay, the, the um, optimizer is gonna love to take your model to its extremes and say, hey, did you know that great things can happen when you're on like the fringes of where your model thinks it knows what's going on? It's like, okay, I don't wanna be there. I wanna be not at the fringes of what my model thinks is happening. So you're gonna have to do a lot of that. And, and one other thing that you're gonna have to be wary of is to make sure that after you add all those constraints that your output isn't just a manifestation of all those constraints. So you said, okay, like I'm gonna constrain the price of this beer to be not too high and the price of that beer to be not too high and, and the price of all of the super premium beer to be not too high. And then at the end you just come out with some output and it's like, oh, well actually I just hit the constraint on every single beer. Uh, so I'm just feeding what the revenue management team wants to hear back to them. You gotta be careful not to do that. And so there's a lot of conversations you need to have there to be like, okay, I understand the constraints you guys wanna put on this. Which of these are really necessary? Where can we sort of loosen them up a little bit to allow the model to do some work? Where can we build trust that the model is gonna do something reasonable? So these are all important parts of solving an optimization problem. And then when you're done, you're gonna have to interpret the results. And that's also really hard. And it's hard to build trust there because you're not building a model. Like I said earlier, you're not predicting things, which means there's no accuracy or error metrics of any kind. There's no validation against real results that you can say, hey, like I predicted, or I optimized in the past, this is what you should have done, and like that compares favorably to what you actually did. There's nothing like that. It doesn't make sense. What the output actually looks like is just a list of decisions, in this case prices. It says, here's a set of beer, here are the prices that you should set the, the beer to. Now, you can compute corresponding effects of those price decisions. You can say, hey, if I set the prices to such and such, then I am expecting that you're going to sell this much more beer. And if that doesn't make any sense, that's a good hint. But, um, but that's something that you need to, that's not a primary output of the optimization. And, and you know, there's errors in the model, and that model error can propagate when you reuse that model to compute the expected effects of your optimal decision. So you gotta be careful. What you need to do is have lots of sense, sense checks. You have to have a lot of human in the loop interactions and a lot of what-if scenarios, then you gotta build trust over time. Okay, so some key takeaways. Uh, we're running out of time here. So the, the three main things I want you to take away from this talk, optimization is interesting and hard. Price optimization is ripe for data science to get involved in. Data science doesn't end with modeling. There's more to data science than just modeling, and don't blame me for high beer prices. Uh, you can thank me for beer promotions, though. Um, okay, thank you very much. I'm fine to take questions. I don't know if people usually bring around a mic. No mics here. Okay, questions, yeah. Oh, oh one's coming. Cool. 
Hello there, thanks for the presentation. Um, I would like to understand, after deploying the prices, how do you guys valid identify and validate the business value that came out of these prices? Yeah, so um, that's really hard. Uh, we're, still, we're still working on that. One thing that we're doing is working a lot with the team that used to set prices before. And so having people on that team being like, hey, um, one thing, the one thing is that we're helping automate a lot of the decisions and they end up being very similar to the decisions that those teams would have set before. And so one thing that helps validate is when we're like, hey, here's like a thousand price points and a lot of them are very similar to what you would have done. And they're like, okay, this is great. Like, it, it takes me to the same place and it saved me a lot of time. And so that sort of helps validate it because um, you're just sort of like on the same page as them. Other than that, you just sort of have to sort of um, look at what happened and be like, hey, I thought that if I set these prices in a certain way, I would make a bunch of money um, and I would lose a little bit of market share. And did I make a bunch of money and lose a little bit of market share? Or if I set prices that way, I would, I would um, sort of gain some market share and lose a little bit of money or something like that. And you have to be very loose with your interpretation. So you shouldn't try to match this to the kind of accuracy metric you're used to with the model. Um, but you should make sure that the things that you think are happening are happening. So if you thought that you would make more money and lose some market share and you lost money and gained market share, something's gone really wrong. Um, so you, you need to sort of be willing to look at what happened with sort of a critical but liberal eye and say, okay, um, how are things changing? And, and you can focus on small areas first. You can say, okay, I'm gonna optimize beer prices in like one little region and see if I can make a dent there and, and move on. And so that's, those are some of the things that we try to do. Uh, great question. 100% um, the kind of uh, pricing you're discussing does create that trust deficit. So I should preface by saying we don't do that. For one thing, we sell beer to um, wholesalers who sell it to retailers who sell it to customers. So that would never happen because there's just like too many layers in between that like we couldn't sort of real-time price in that way. Real-time pricing is a can of worms. Um, I don't really have a suggestion there other than like be very careful. What I can tell you is that there are whole industries who have been thinking about that trust deficit for a long time. The one that comes to mind is the airline industry. So, so su maybe surprisingly, but like the airline industry was one of the first industries that was thinking very carefully about dynamic pricing. And there's a good reason for that, right? So um, there's a difference when you're talking about uh, optimal pricing, there's a difference between goods that sort of expire and goods that don't. And you might not think of it, but airline seats actually do sort of expire. Like as you get closer to the flight, if they don't sell their, their airline seats, once the flight takes off, those things are useless and the, the goods expire. And so, so when you have goods that expire, um, you have to be a little bit more careful. And because of that, the airline industry has been involved in this for a long time and, and they're very aware of, of these trust issues. And so if that's a, an issue for you, I'm probably not the best person to talk to somebody from like the airline industry is, but I'm, I'm definitely aware that that's like a huge problem and something that you need to be aware of. And, and as a customer, it also frustrates me. Um, you definitely don't want to be like, oh, hey, are you pricing this higher because you think I can afford it? Um, that's, that's a bad experience. Hey. Hey. Um, so uh, you've been talking a lot about optimization. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, but uh, we've been talking about this uh, without the time component kind of attached to it. Uh, we're obviously building all the models, the elasticity models, and optimization of the historical data, but we've had massive upsets happening recently with COVID, with enormous inflation and everything. How are you guys accounting for this? Because I'm assuming you're planning for 23, if not 24 at this point. Yeah. Um, 
so right now we're mostly planning for 2023, not 2024. Uh, that, that is a thing that, I mean, I guess in some ways, so we've got like a, a one-year plan, a five-year plan, and a 10-year plan, but usually the pricing is sort of like one year away. Um, I, I don't have an, an easy answer um, to your question in general about sort of like how do you account for these things other than uh, usually it's upstream of the optimization component. So like you've got these models that are trying to understand price elasticity, and those models are going to be strongly affected by things like COVID and, and other things. And price elasticity is different in the face of COVID versus not. And so we have another team which is sort of adjacent to my team, but it is not my team that handles that. And there's a bunch of economists on it. And, and the way we handle it is I say like, like hey, economists, like, please handle this. Um, but, uh, but, but in seriousness, yeah, that's, that's a hard problem, and, and it does come up. And, and a lot of it comes up in, in working with the elasticity and saying, hey, like, when I look at data, what data do I have that looks like what I think is going to happen next year? Maybe I don't use the whole data set. I say, okay, here's, like, some prediction about, like, what I think the environment is like next year. And how do I look at the data that I have that is in an environment that I think is similar to the one next year and sort of weight that more highly? I don't want to throw away all my data, but I want to, like, pay more attention to the data historically that looks like what I think is coming and, and hope that that affects the, the elasticities, basically. This is on, yeah. So the way you were talking about validation uh, sounds like you know there's no no obvious way to do it, right? Um, I th I think there might be a way where if you know information in advance, you can probably treat it like a unit test, right? You, you get the recommendations and you see if they pass in some sense. Uh, how does your team deal with that, or is it mostly done externally by checks by by the business? Yeah, so, so another good question. Um, so one thing I just want to sort of say about that in terms of uh, looking at these things in advance is that the, the optimization algorithm is not going to spit out uh, what it thinks the value of like, your revenue is. If you're trying to optimize for revenue, the optimization engine is going to tell you what price it thinks is going to optimize your revenue, but not what the corresponding revenue is going to be. You can go back and you can calculate what you think that revenue is going to be if you set that price as such. But in order to do that, you're using some underlying model. And so there's, you can try to validate, but the validation is sort of subject to the same errors that show up in your model. So, so you can do things like this, and we do, um, but just like be, you need to be very aware that like there's, the error in your model actually compounds because it shows up twice. It shows up once because you're using that model. You're going to effectively take a derivative of your model, but the error propagates through there when you figure out what the optimal price is. And then it shows up again when you sub that price back into the model to figure out what the corresponding revenue is. So you, you just need to be aware of that. And then beyond that, yeah, you can try to say, hey, like, based on the optimization and the models we have, this is what I think is going to happen. Um, and then you, you sort of write that down in advance, and then you run the experiment, and then you look at what happened. And you're like, hey, how far away was I? And, and so, of course, we do these sorts of things, but you just have to be very careful because um, the expectations, if, if you come from a background of doing more model building, which I do, um, you have certain expectations about, like, in different regimes, what kind of errors are appropriate in certain types of models. And the ones in optimization are usually bigger than you're used to because there's this compound error. And that's basically what we've learned is that's still okay. Like, we're still getting things directionally right, and we're still maybe doing a better job than what people were doing um, pricing things by human instead of by sort of optimization. But um, you just have to be careful not to have expectations that are similar to like model metrics um, in terms of the, the metric value. So um, for those who didn't hear, the question, it's a great question. The question was, how is this not also a model? Um, it's still sort of subject to the inputs of the world, and, and things change over time, and you have to pay attention to these things. And in sort of like a um, colloquial definition of a model, it absolutely is a model. Like there's, there's a model in the sense that like I am trying to write down some equations that somehow represent the real world that is happening here. Um, but it's not like a machine learning model in the sense that I'm not training it with data. That's not what's happening. There's like an underlying model that I'm training with data, but what's really going on here is, is a lot more focused on the, the math itself and sort of 
taking derivatives and a bunch of sort of well-known math there. And so there's, there's not this aspect of like I trained it with data. If I have a different data set input, I'll get something different. That sort of thing doesn't exist here. And so that's why I like to use the word optimization layer. There is a sense in which this is a model because it believes it's an accurate projection of reality, which maybe it's not, but it, it tries to do that. Um, but I don't like to use that term model. I like to use the term optimization layer because there is something fundamentally different about this optimization stuff than sort of like a data model where you're like using data to train a model and, and make predictions. Because that's not what's happening here. You're not, you're not using data and you're not making predictions. So it, it is fundamentally different in some way. Um, unfortunately, we have to stop. If people have more questions, I would be so grateful to uh, hear about them on the app or to chat with you outside. Thank you all so much for coming. I appreciate it.